Today is the 12th of August, 2009. We are in Margaretville, New York at the American Legion Post number 216. Okay. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. And uh, please, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? My full name is Patricia Geraldine Swoboda, or also Patricia Geraldine Mann Swoboda. And you were born? Oh, I'm sorry. I was born in Detroit, Michigan on February 18th, 1958. And did you attend school there? Yes, I did. Um, I grew up in Detroit, and we moved out to the suburbs into Farmington Hills, Michigan, in um, for my freshman year basically mm -hmm. and I went to school out at Our Lady of Mercy High School in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And what year did you graduate? I graduated in 1976. Mm -hmm. Did you go on to college at that point? No I did not. I In February of 76 I joined the delayed entry program. I joined the Women's Army Corps under the delayed entry program mm -hmm. just after my 18th birthday and I shipped out in July. Okay, so back then it was uh, the... The Women's Army Corps Women's was Army still Corps. there. I have my Palace Athena. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, which you can't get anymore. And what was that like uh, back then? We were experimentals. Mm -hmm. We got to wear, our, our particular uh, group got to wear our helmets the entire time. Um, it used to be that women would wear, like, PT uniforms and all of that. Uh, no, we, we got to wear tennis shoes, but we wore BDUs, mm -hmm. which were fatigues at that time. And we wore steel pots throughout the entire time. Mm -hmm. We hardly ever took them off, basically to sleep. All right, and, and your basic training, uh, what did that consist of? Uh, it was 6.8 weeks mm -hmm. of um, general military training. Um, it was in Anniston, Alabama at Fort McClellan, which is now closed. Mm -hmm. um, and we did PT, we ran with packs, we did fake grenade fields, mm -hmm. we did shoot M16s and fired and, and qualified on them. Uh, boy, that was a long time ago, <laughs> so it's like, I just remember, I think the thing I remember the most about basic training was just being terrified that I wasn't going to salute the right person, so you'd cross the street if you mm -hmm. could, because um, you didn't know what your, you didn't know your ranks at that time. Mm -hmm. Was, was that your first time away from home? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the south and you've been in the north your entire life, it took me four days to figure out sometimes what they were saying because mm -hmm. it just it's so southern. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated there and went on to um, trying to think. To, I remember remember being on KP duty. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I remember <clears throat> stuffing clothes in the ceiling because we did because guys got to iron the guys got to send their clothes out to iron but us women we had to iron our own clothes mm -hmm. and you had to put certain pleats in certain areas on even your fatigues you had to press off before each meal um, I remember people <clears throat> including myself hiding things in the ceiling which was not effective because um, they knew to look there mm -hmm. and and we had one time our drill surgeon we called her her name was Drill Sergeant Huss. We always called them Drill Sergeant. We didn't call them Sergeants. They were Drill mm -hmm. Sergeants. Drill Sergeant Huss was also nicknamed the White Tornado because mm -hmm. um, she would come through and really like rip the place apart if you left anything out. I remember one time somebody had unfortunately left a can of spray starch out and just about three quarters of the locker lockers were covered with spray starch. There were also occasional mm -hmm. beds down the stairwell and Nothing we couldn't cope with, but just enough to keep you on touch and mm -hmm. uh, keep you in, in line. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things I got the most out of BASIC was the, um, the sense of teamwork. Mm -hmm. I had actually gotten, I was, I had enlisted for BASIC lab, for medical lab, and paperwork got messed up and they put me in MP school, mm -hmm. which was to start the day after my basic training, and I lost it. And I realized long after that that was my breaking point, and I became a team member that day. Mm -hmm. when, I, when it got fixed and, and things started working, I became a team member at that point. Okay. 
So you went on to MP school? No, I was a medical laboratory. Okay, so, so I went you... down to Fort Sam Houston, and we were um, we were the first people that were going to be in the new in the new barracks that they had. Mm -hmm. They had built. They looked like Holiday Inns at the time. They had carpeting and they had uh, wood beds and mm -hmm. wooden metal wall lockers or lockers, and it was really good digs. Mm -hmm. We were most of now nowadays they do more um, they do more soldiering along with our studies, mm -hmm. but they gave us more they were focused more on studies than mm -hmm. they the soldiering. We still did soldiering, but we did a lot more studying from the people have come back through afterward. Mm -hmm. I understand that they've done done that. Now did you uh, train with uh, the men also? At that point, yes. My my basic training was all female. Mm -hmm. We did have one, I think we had one or two male drill sergeants within the whole building mm -hmm. um, in the battalion. I remember one for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it was predominantly all female. Mm -hmm. And I was I was housed though at the at Fort Sam Houston. I was housed in the same building as males, but housed in a full female room. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how long did that uh, training last? I started in September and I finished in somewhere in January. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know why I can't remember those weeks. Why basic training six point eight weeks? Maybe because I was focused on I was going to be in basic for six point eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent uh, we did classes. They we had so many people going through at the time. They broke the classes into two parts. So. Some of us, I was an evening class mm -hmm. person. I went late afternoon and early evening, and then they had the early morning still, mm -hmm. like early afternoon. Mm -hmm. So they split us up at that point. There were so many of us going through. Once you graduated, uh, were you promoted at that point? I think so. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember. I was, I think I was a, at a PFC by the time I got to my first station, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. I was uh, sent overseas to Germany. For your first duty station? For my first station. duty station, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and how did you get over to Germany? Did you fly or? We flew, flew I think we flew commercial. There's mm -hmm. when one flight I remember, I came back on an uh, emergency leave, when my grandmother passed, and I flew backwards on a transport plane. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the times have been civilian. Okay, so when you were sent over to Germany, did anyone else go from your class, or? There were people that were in my my class, but not that I'd really associated strongly with. But mm -hmm. we knew each other kind of. Mm -hmm. um, when we got to when we got to Lon no when we got to Frankfurt, I think it was when Frankfurt is when they split us all up, mm -hmm. and the people we kind of went together with kind of we were there for a couple of days I think and then they split us into where they needed us mm -hmm. at that point. So what was, so when did you go over to Germany? And it would have been just before my birthday because <laughs> it was kind of a crappy birthday present or so I thought at the time because mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody I was at a new place I, yeah. I was eight I was just turning 19 at that time so I'd never been really out of out of the US much less away from home that long and mm -hmm. Um, so, so, how long was uh, the tour in Germany? Was it? Two it was years? actually. I ended up being there for three and a half. I I extended my stay until oh, okay. um, I got ready to um, get out of service. Okay. And, and whereabouts in Germany were you stationed? I was stationed at the 130th Station Hospital in Heidelberg, Germany, okay. the place where Patton died. Mm -hmm. um, he died in the the commander's office, actually. Oh. Get, that's part of the tour. Um, I was stationed at the 30, 30th Field Hospital in Worms. And the, no wait, I'm going to get my, my units mixed up now. One was in at Coleman Barracks mm -hmm. in my, outside of Mannheim, Germany. And then I went back to Heidelberg and then I ended up out in Worms. And mm -hmm. I think Worms was the 30th. What did your typical duty day consist of? Being a lab tech, um, along with all of the things that we did with the military, um, the focus was taking care of the dependents and the military over 
in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I did just lab, and that was back in the days when much of lab was manual. Mm -hmm. You ran batch tests, you didn't run separate tests, you ran them in batches. Um, our blood gas machine used, the first thing you did when you knew you had to get a blood gas, which I know I'm speaking Greek to probably you, but that's checking the oxygen content of your blood. The first thing you did was you called the weather bureau to find out what the barometric pr pressure was because you had to do a calculation to set the machine. And it would take a half hour, something that takes 10 seconds now, would take a half hour to set up. Mm. And uh, it, was a, it was a great duty assignment. That was in Heidelberg. In Worms, I ran my own lab, basically. I had a, a German national, Frau Heinzmann, mm -hmm. who was with me for a number of years. She retired. And they deemed that I was 1. 1. 1.8 of a person or 1.6 of a person that they needed for the job. They, you, you figured it out based on your, on your output and your work and everything. And so they didn't send anybody else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I got to do it all anyway. Now, were you in Germany when they did away with the WAC Corps? I was actually, um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there was a whole, there's still a, a ton of debate exactly when that happened. Um, I'm sure somewhere I've got it in some mm -hmm. paper that says when it actually did. But yeah, they changed all of the PT requirements. They changed everything on us. Now, what, what was that like when, I mean, was that like basically like overnight? You knew that uh, it was coming, and then as of such and such a date, it, you were... It was kind of like, to maybe I just wasn't paying any attention. Mm -hmm. I was, what, 20? Mm -hmm. um, it just, as far as I know, it kind of just happened, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. all our requirements changed. We didn't have a choice about it. Mm -hmm. And they didn't give you a chance. You, you didn't have any choice to get in or get out. You mm -hmm. just, you got automatically turned into the Army. Mm -hmm. did, did you personally notice much of a change? Um, in terms of my job, my regular stuff, no. In terms of the, the army things, mm -hmm. per se, and I, and I say that as in soldiering skills, yes, there were some changes in soldiering skills, but also I had been in that group that had done all the experimentals, mm -hmm. you know, wear the helmet all the time, wear your fatigues all the time, things like that, so it might not have been so much of a wake-up call for me because I'd already gone through some of that. Mm -hmm. At that time, we still wore whites, too. I mean, you wore a completely white uniform. So it, it, in that respect, it really didn't change much. Mm -hmm. PT tests and stuff changed mm -hmm. much harder. <laughs> now, how many women were in your unit? In Heidelberg? Actually, it was probably just a mixed ratio. I don't remember it being more or less. I mm -hmm. mean, we had, I think we had the first floor. And I think the guys had the second floor. And when they shoved us into another building, too, they had to add on. Mm -hmm. We had, like, the girls had one floor and the guys had the other floor. We had a joint shower that we had to yell out. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to have published times, but it got to be so mm -hmm. crazy that we just didn't bother with mm -hmm. it. We just yell out if somebody needed to use it. Mm -hmm. Now once once you became integrated as, as part of when they did away with the uh, WAC Corps, mm -hmm. uh, did you have men on the same floor in different rooms? We actually had that in our um, school. Okay. And we were still WAX, I believe, at that time. I mm -hmm. don't believe it had been disbanded at that point. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we just were, were housed, we were housed in separate rooms. Mm -hmm. So. Now were you uh, promoted while you were in Germany? I was promoted to E4 Specialist 4. Mm -hmm. um, I got caught in the freezes during the Carter administration. I attempted to get into uh, PA school. I mm -hmm. was frozen on that. I got frozen in rank. <laughs> I actually had very much considered re-enlisting and staying active and was going to go to the Presidio. I had a pinpoint assignment to the Presidio. Mm -hmm. And it may sound funny, but I, at that point I was living on the economy with a group of soldiers. And I had cats. And I had no place to take the cats. And I kind of been taught that you take care of an animal all its life. You just don't mm. ditch them. Right. And um, there was no guarantee I'd have off-post housing at the Presidio. And, I, and between that and not getting the PA school that I wanted. It was like, forget it. 
I'd been locked in rank for, for quite a time at that point. It wasn't for lack of points or anything. It was mm -hmm. just, in fact, I had actually won, um, I don't know, one earned, uh, so, like Soldier of the Court or something. It was beyond me. I, I don't even remember doing it. I just remember them saying, you get to go to Berlin for a week. And I got to go to East, East and West Berlin for uh -huh. a week when the wall was still up. I actually have a chunk of the wall in my house. Now, what was that like for you in Berlin? That taught me what freedom means. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to the kids in school and when I talk to other people, I understand what freedom means because I've seen the crosses that were on the, floor, on the ground around the wall area. Mm -hmm. And I was to Checkpoint Charlie Museum and some of the other stuff. I also was to East Berlin. They took us over there for the day and I, you could see the difference. It was gray. It was dark. Um, I mean, the sun was out that day. Mm -hmm. But it was just very subdued. I mean, I know we were restricted to certain areas. We were restricted. They, when we went to Berlin, they, they, you know, you had to show your papers, and it was all real, real technical. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm, I'm pretty young at that point. You know, it was a lot of it. I look back at it now and just kind of shake my head, going, "Wow!" Mm -hmm. But I saw the wall, mm -hmm. and they had guards in the towers that had rifles pointing at us while mm -hmm. we were looking at the wall. And we were told we couldn't cross. There was like a, a chain link, a chain, like, like you get in the, like, like to keep a line in kind of, but it was low. Mm -hmm. And they said you couldn't cross over it, but I managed to get a stick. <laughs> and I got a cornerstone because the wall was made out of buildings originally. Uh -huh. And I ended up taking and wiggling this piece of, this chunk of cornerstone that's about like, like that. And in fact, when I, um, when I got out and I had everything shipped, my, my, then, my then boyfriend, who's now my husband, uh -huh. was hauling this up to the third floor and said, what the blank you got in here, rocks? And we uh -huh. opened it up and it was, it was this huge cornerstone from the Berlin Wall. And, so. and uh, no one had an issue with you taking it? Nobody had an issue with anybody taking it. It was, you just couldn't cross the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that, and I got a small piece of blue glass that was from one of the windows. Mm -hmm. It was just, it, nobody had problems with it. Uh -huh. People would take little tiny pieces of it, because it wasn't the whole wall, it was what was left of it. Sure. And I thought that would be, and then I, of course when the Berlin Wall came down, I'm thinking, geez, how much money could I make on this sucker, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go anywhere. Uh -huh. Hi, Diane. Hi. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, your boyfriend at the, at the time later became your husband, uh, was he in the same field? He's never been in the service. I met him three days after I got us out of the service from a mutual oh, friend I see. who was in the service with me. Uh -huh. um, he, and, he and his girlfriend and I and my boyfriend at the time in Europe dated to get, we, we did double dating, we mm -hmm. place, went to Rome once, um, mm -hmm. we'd go skiing, mm -hmm. and then I got out. He, he had actually gotten sent to, um, John had gotten sent to Belgium. Mm -hmm. And so he had like every holiday off that you could imagine because they get all the NATO holidays. <laughs> and then I got out and I knew he was at Fort Dix. So mm -hmm. I looked him up at Fort Dix and his car was dead and he called his buddy. It's my husband. Mm -hmm. and we've been married 25 years this year. Wow. <laughs> so we met 30 years ago. Now, when you were over in uh, Germany, did you have a car? No, I did. Um, I did drive over there. I drove a Cracker Box, which is the the ambulances that they they, mm -hmm. they call them Cracker Box because they look like a big box of crackers on the back of a truck. Uh -huh. um, they were our ambulances, and occasionally I I didn't do it as a job per se, but I did it occasionally when we'd have to get some somebody go somewhere or. You did a run somewhere. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like rotated. It was a soldiering duty. Mm -hmm. It rotated. And I, nope, I think that was about all I drove. My, my boyfriend had use of a car occasionally. It was mm -hmm. too expensive. And gas was, gas, what, what we paid for gas here now looks bad, but I didn't want to think what it would have been over there now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you came back to the States. You mm -hmm. got out of I, out of the service. I got out of the service. I had a four-year obligation, and I spent my four years in. Mm -hmm. And then on April Fool's Day in 1981, I rejoined, and I picked that date intentionally. All right. Now, did you go on active duty, or 
I was in the reserves. Reserves, okay. Mm -hmm. Army at reserves? Army reserves. And okay. that was down at Fort, Fort Hamilton, mm -hmm. down in Brooklyn. All right. And you, you trained one weekend a month back one then? One weekend a month, two weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in, by that point, I made my E5. I was in several units down there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to remember them now. Were you uh, basically in the same field? Same kind of field. Um, I was one of the few people that was a reservist who was actually doing laboratory work on the outside. Mm -hmm. So they gave me a lot of, a lot more responsibility because I actually was doing it. Mm -hmm. When we'd go, I remember one time we went up to Fort Drum and we were working a live lab. Um, a lot of times it was paper, a lot of times it was you know, going in practice, and this particular one was a live exercise. We were actually running a live small laboratory, and they, my commander was ill, and I ended up kind of covering everything mm -hmm. for about 72 hours. I decided at 72 hours that um, that was enough time. Mm -hmm. I started seeing little stick figures rain in front of my eyes. I said, that's it, guys. I can't do it anymore. But I, also one of the things the military did teach me is just how far I can push my body. Mm -hmm. Something that I don't know that a lot of people know how to do that. Mm -hmm. You can go far beyond what you think you can. When you think you should just be over and time to go to sleep, time, it's, mm -hmm. that's it. You've got a reserve in you that you can pull way out. Mm -hmm. I learned that. I mean, I was there during the original, I was in Germany in the original Iran, Iran crisis. We were on high alert. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what was going to happen. I had friends that had life estimates of an hour that were on the Korean border. Mm -hmm. Let, actually, the Korean border, I think, had like a 15 minute, you had 15 minutes to be alive, basically, they, they calculated. And it might have just been scuttle talk, but it yeah. makes sense to me, mm -hmm. you know. And we were there when the Badr-Mannhof, Badr-Mannhof, Mannheim gang mm -hmm. was doing their thing, and they were blowing up cars and buildings mm -hmm. and you'd get on a train and not know if you're going to make it home yeah. or you'd go in and I mean I was on places where they had blown up stuff mm -hmm. the terrorists were very active during that period sorry I didn't mean to slip back no, that's right. to Germany but yeah we and so when and and this is an aside I guess but when 9-11 happened it I think I probably moved through that very fast because where the rest of the country was all, number one, I thought it was going to be activated. Okay, actually, so, so you were on uh, I actually, reserve duty. Then. I actually was mobilized for Desert Storm mm -hmm. in January for Desert Shield. I left my five-month-old with my husband, mm -hmm. and I went to Paul's Church, Virginia. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping around now. No, I'm not making it consistent. That's fine. Um, so we'll go back to... My time with the reserves, a lot of it was one weekend a month, mm -hmm. two weeks out of the year. I was on advance party sometimes, so um, I'd go in a couple days early or stay a couple days late mm -hmm. because I'd be going in and setting up stuff for people, housing and um, making sure all, all, everything was all set. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't the only one that did that, but I was one of the ones that did. Because mm -hmm. at that point I was at least E5 or E6, mm -hmm. probably E5. And then I got, I got asked to be mobilized for Desert Shield. And I was asked to go down to the Armed Services Blood Program Office mm -hmm. in Falls, Falls Church, Virginia. So you accepted that assignment? I accepted the assignment. I figured I probably was going to get mobilized anyway. I might as well if I knew where I was going at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked at the ASBO. Mm -hmm. How did your husband feel about that? Was he supportive? Yes. Mm -hmm. It put a great strain on our relationship. Mm -hmm. And there were some other things that were going on too. Um, he he had um, he had brain surgery in 1996, and this thing was brewing mm -hmm. during that whole period, which we mm -hmm. had no clue. We mm -hmm. had no clue until '96 when he ended up having surgery. Mm -hmm. In a large benign brain right. tumor, okay. but it was doing weird things on him back, mm -hmm. way back in the 90s, mm -hmm. in the early 90s that we didn't know. Okay. Um, so he was supportive, but it, w it did put a great strain on our relationship. Mm -hmm.
And how long were you down there for? I was there for about four months, four to five months. Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, I was there during, I was there when the ground war, I remember where I was when the ground war started. I was, we were going to Long John Silver's for dinner, <laughs> picking up dinner on the way home, and they announced it on the TV, and we turned around, grabbed our dinner, went right back to work. Uh -huh. So, um, and I worked with another person, I worked with several people that I had, I'd known from where I was working. I was working in blood bank situations to begin with, the, mm -hmm. the areas I was working in. Um, and at the, where I had been doing with the reserves, we had two or three groups that were all, I don't want to say a whole lot, but that, that they were working with different aspects of blood. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, even though I wasn't in charge formally, formally in charge of people, I ended up being in charge of about 30 people, mm -hmm. making sure that all the as different aspects, we didn't have the whole the whole thing there. We had part of it there and part of it was in another spot. Mm -hmm. um, I made sure that everybody could do their job. Mm -hmm. And so then I went for Desert Storm and I did come back a couple times. Now you were overseas for Desert Storm? No, I was I was stateside. I was a stateside. I was okay. an REMF and very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I can, uh, rear echelon yeah, blank I, blank. <laughs> um, we're on tape. I don't know how much you really want that. No, that's all right. I think people can figure out what the MF is. Yeah. Um, but, yes, and I was proud of it. Mm -hmm. Because for every one person in the theater, there are ten people back here supporting. Mm -hmm. They can't do it without us back here. Mm -hmm. And I had friends I had friends that I talked to, though, that were over in the sandbox. We'd be on the, we were on the box to them all the time talking, mm -hmm. coordinating things. And they were... I, I mean, I don't know how many times the chemical hooters would go off, and they'd have to go. It would just be, bye. Mm -hmm. And, because uh, you never knew what was going on. So I had a lot of, I had friends over there. Mm -hmm. Good friends, friends I had worked with for years that were over in the sandbox. Okay. So once uh, Desert Storm was over, um, what, what happened next? Um... I stayed in the, I stayed in my reserve unit for a little bit longer, mm -hmm. and then I went into the um, individual mobilization augmentee and IMA soldier. IMA soldiers, and again, realized there were, at this point, three kids. Mm -hmm. I was traveling, I was living up here and traveling to Brooklyn for my drills, <laughs> and working full time. Mm -hmm. So it just, it was like three, and I was working weekends too. I was working in Walton at the time. I'm still working in Walton now, but that there were break there was a break in there but mm -hmm. I would was working three out of four weekends because I'd work two weekends at work and I'd work one weekend with the reserves and yeah mm -hmm. I said that's okay that's fine and and my commander had talked to me about being an IMA soldier um, and so what I did was this is where I had my break in having what they call a good year in the reserves mm -hmm. um, Bill was sick I had three young kids the they they would assign me a spot and mm -hmm. but they were all doing this huge realignment for several years mm -hmm. and every time they get me realigned just about the time that I would come up on a list they'd reassign me on a different line and I'd get lost in the shuffle and because I had so much stuff going on at the house I never pushed it mm -hmm. and and maybe it's a cop out but I I had my hands full I have um I have right I have a I had three kids under five mm -hmm and a husband that was having problems, but we didn't know what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And about the time they found me and settled the whole tow line thing down, um, that was after his surgery, about a year after that. And I think I had one year that I didn't do anything with them. And then I, what an IMA soldier does is they do a two week period out of the year. Mm -hmm. And then they do, they do points whether through correspondence courses or going to seminars or whatever. Mind you, this entire time I'm still doing lab, mm -hmm. and I'm still a lab person. In fact, um, I have an M4, what they call an M4 qualifier on my MOS, which means I'm a specialist in blood banking. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot more blood banking training than the average tech. 
actually that was another that's a that's a back aside with the reserves mm -hmm. um, in one of the units I was assigned to at Fort Hamilton uh, we had Klaus Mayer who was the head of I think the head of blood bank at Sloan Kettering was also a full bird mm -hmm. and he taught us I had the one of the head guys up at the American Red Cross National Office, the National Labs out of Maryland. He would come up for his drills, and he would teach us, mm -hmm. Bob. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, I got a lot of good stuff out of the military. I really did. Mm -hmm. They got their share out of me, too, but mm -hmm. I got so much, so much benefit out of it. Um, so I did, I did that on, on 9-11, and, and I did that for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, most of my, my actual assignment was Brook Army Medical Center. Mm -hmm. what, what was it like uh, <clears throat> when 9-11 happened? What was, I, it, what was I, what, was I, your unit? Put on immediate alert. I or? was I was with the IMA. I figured when that happened, number one, I needed to get down to New York. That I was going to end up having to drive to Texas. I figured when those when that second plane went, in, I'm like, I'm activated. I went and got my uniforms all together. I got my I went and got my poor little truck that was really sad. <laughs> it was due for an inspection that, that week anyway, and I pushed it in and, and said, you need to inspect this today because I'm probably driving to Texas tonight. I figured I was gone. Mm -hmm. I, there was no question. Um, we were under attack. I I, I never got a call, mm -hmm. and I think what that what part of that was was because I also figured they'd call me because they might need help down in New York, mm -hmm. you know, accessing a, a database of lab. But obviously there weren't any real survivors, so they didn't need any mm -hmm. of us. And. I spent the next three years uh, till 2004, and then I said, you know, it's time. Mm -hmm. And you were an E7 at that point? I was point? E7. I actually made E7 when I came out of um, Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. I got some nice stuff out of Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Okay. I made a mer uh, joint meritorious medal mm -hmm. out of the rank. Do you, do you miss uh, the service at all, or the reserves? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it's still really, really strange getting that gray letter. Mm -hmm. I get a gray, I, it's called the gray, I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's, it's called the gray, it's, they call retirees that are not, that are retired out of the reserves, they call them gray area retirees because we don't, pay, we don't get any, any money yet. Until age 60, right? 65, I think it is. Really? I'll have to look, but I, I can look afterward when we're off tape, but okay. I believe it's 65. I know what other things I did was I... I, I know with the National Guard, it, once you got your 20 in, at age 60... See, I have to look because I thought it was 65. Now, it might be 60 for all I know. I, I, think, I, just, it, I think it is. Well, what I did was, and it may be different because I did something so that if something should happen to me, my kids and husband will get my benefits. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you just go into this, you roll into this other other thing. So I set it up so that I might, I might get a little later too, that's what I'm saying, because of the way I set it up, so that mm -hmm. if something should happen to me between when I retired in 04 mm -hmm. and when I retire, retire, that if something should happen, they'll get, they'll mm -hmm. get my retirement. Okay. Because they're young enough, they need, sure. they're all in their teens now, but mm -hmm. when I made that decision, they weren't. Mm -hmm. And Bill, Bill, of course, was still, he's got some residual problems with short-term memory and stuff, mm -hmm. so. Is your husband working now? He's disabled. I see. He also had a major heart attack two years oh. ago. Okay. So, he's done very well. You wouldn't know it if you talked to him. Mm -hmm. In fact, he may show up. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But um, he's done very well. Okay. So um, have, you, have you made any use of any of the veterans benefits like the GI Bill or? Actually I did in a roundabout way. Um, I went, I had taken a few 
college courses when I was overseas. Mm -hmm. And I took another CLEP exam during Desert Storm. Um, but I hadn't really done anything with it, and I kind of fartled around. And, and the state was coming up with this. If you want to work nights, weekends, or anything by yourself, you need to, you have to have a bachelor's degree with X amount in, in the sciences, mm -hmm. in chemistry and biology, and X amount of math. Math was never the problem. It was getting the upper level sciences. Um, but at that point, I didn't have anything. So I went to Nyack College. Nyack offered a, a program that was like one night a week. Mm -hmm. so it, it's only for adults. It's a working adult program. Mm -hmm. And I took my senior year through them, but I needed to come up with a whole lot of, like two years worth of credits. And God bless the people at West Point. <laughs> the West Point Educational Center, I kudos, kudos. Um, they helped me out a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And I took almost all my accreditation from my bachelor's, except for my senior year through NIAC, through military crediting. Mm -hmm. I, I took CLEP exams, I took Regents exams, and I didn't pay for any of them. Well, mm -hmm. I paid by being in the military, but mm -hmm. I didn't have to fork out cash for them. Mm -hmm. So you so got your bachelor's. I got my bachelor's there. in organizational management from NIAC, tweaked so that I can work in lab. Mm -hmm. But I always, I'm, I'm one of these people, you know, you need more than one thing. Mm -hmm. Good thing to have something in the back pocket. Because mm -hmm. you never know where you're going to be or when you're going to be. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that's how I did that. And uh, obviously you've joined the uh, American Legion. Yep, and I'm on the board. I was commander for a couple years. Mm -hmm. Um, I, they have been begging me to be commander for the county, which I've kind of said next year I probably will. When you get small kids, the, the guys have it different. The guys don't, pardon this, but the guys don't get it. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a husband who's disabled, and i got three kids, mm -hmm. and I work full time. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of spare time. I'm doing most of the stuff for the house. Mm -hmm. the guys, they'll pass it to their wives to do. Your wife will take care of this. Your wife will make sure that the clothes are clean. I don't want to make sure the clothes are cleaned. You know, Bill does help a lot. My mm -hmm. husband helps a tremendous amount. But it comes down to ending up being kind of more the woman ends up sure. kind of running the household. And I haven't had, I, I want to make sure that my, my, my second child gets through high school and into college, and then I'll have a little bit of free space. My, mm -hmm. my daughter is very... Um, very bright, mm -hmm. and she she takes after me. I think I don't want to say that too loud. She mm -hmm. get annoyed with that, but she uh, she's like I was kind of when I was younger too. Mm -hmm. Outgoing, very very um, very detailed, very results oriented. Mm -hmm. and she's. Like, she's in her, although I guess I was more geeky than she is. That's what she's told me. <laughs> when she found out I played Dungeons and Dragons, that was really a lot of fun. We used to do that over in, overseas. Uh -huh. We'd have full day, full weekends, and we'd have, we, we were, I was living on the economy at that time, mm -hmm. and we, we'd play Dungeons and Dragons, and I'd make trays of baked fried chicken, just buy chicken and just, Bread it and throw it in the oven, and we'd break for dinner sometimes. But people would break and play, and then they'd go and they'd come, and it lasted till about four o'clock on Sunday, and then everybody got kicked out, and we got ready for work the next day. Uh huh. <laughs> but um, yeah, now, she's, she's a smart cookie. Now, have you stayed in contact with anyone you've been in the service with? Yes, I have several several friends that I've um, been in touch with. I have a very good friend who replaced me when I was stationed in at Coleman Barracks. Mm -hmm. Her name is Beth, and she's down in Atlanta. I've got some friends down in San Antonio I still kind of keep touch with. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm finding people on Facebook and classmates all the time. But oh. Facebook is where I'm finding friends. Uh -huh. So people I've lost touch with that I didn't want to lose touch with. There are some people I'm still looking for mm -hmm. that I've lost touch with. Mm -hmm. Some who I thought, one I thought I found, but it wasn't her. Oh. <laughs> Same name, but not her. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Totally. I would not be the person I am today mm -hmm. if I hadn't joined the military. 
Okay. Um, everything. I mm -hmm. mean, it's. It gave me it gave me self esteem mm -hmm. that I didn't have when I was in when I was eighteen. Mm -hmm. Had you not gone into the service, uh, what what field do you think you would have gone into? Would it have been the mil uh, medical would have, field? Probably would have been the medical field. Mm -hmm. Although we we joked, I could either. It's a lot. That's a whole nother take. But um, I did not have the the most pleasant household when I was in mm -hmm. my teens with a second marriage um, and with my dad with a second marriage. My, my, my mom died mm -hmm. when I was young and the joke was I could either join the army or I could become a nun because mm -hmm. I was going to a parochial girl school. Um, I decided I liked boys I <laughs> joined, and I didn't join the army for that reason. I actually uh -huh. joined the army. I looked at all four services. Um, Air Force wouldn't guarantee me my job. Um, the Marines wanted a one and a half page bio one or two page biography, mm -hmm. and the Navy didn't offer medical. They didn't have what I wanted. So mm -hmm. actually, what I really wanted to do originally was to go. I didn't wanted nothing to do with medical. I actually wanted to work on nuclear subs. I wanted to to work on the submarines on the on the engines, mm -hmm. um, and it was close to women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did you bring any photographs with you? At I all? don't have a photograph with me. Um, I've got it, I believe, on on my computer at home. Um, okay. I've been having some problems, so I, we dumped off a bunch of stuff, and I didn't get home in time this morning to get it. Try to pull it mm -hmm. off. I can see if I can get it by the end of today, though. Okay, or you, you can just uh, mail it into us. Okay. And within uh, within two weeks, I'll send you a copy of this. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Excellent.